Welcome. Well, you are at home with Jim and Joy, and we are thrilled that you yeah. have invited us into your <laughs> home. Right. You're an important part of the EWTN family, and we would love to hear from you. This is a live show. You can send us an email, Jim and Joy at EWTN.com. Today, we're going to be talking marriage and children and um, how yep. to have a successful marriage, how to raise your children to be saints. We're going to have a wonderful guest. Her name is Marian Budnick, and she's the author of many books, including Raise Happy Children Through a Happy Marriage and Raise Happy Children, Raise Them to be Saints. It was a joy just to speak to Marianne in the back room, and she is a wealth of knowledge, really lives uh, what she shares. And uh, so she'll share so many spiritual truths and practical truths to raise up our children to be saints and to bless our marriages. And so there's so many components to this, but Joy, something so critical in our lives has been daily prayer as a couple for 39 years now. Is it that long? It's that long. And yeah. you know what? <laughs> You're married to me. Years, I would want to be married to you 39 more, and I still wouldn't be enough. I'm telling you the truth. You're so sweet. Thank I you mean so it. Much. I love you. But that's a highlight for us every morning. We usually do our readings sometimes together, sometimes separately, always a portion of scripture. And then we come together and we pray for one another. Um, and I just want to speak about the byproduct of prayer or what we're encountering in prayer. Because maybe that'll motivate you to pray with your wife um, or the wife with, with the husband that you would be so moved. The unity that we experience, that I experience yes, in, in prayer I do with too. you. I was thinking about that this morning. Just so unified. Don't we want unity in our marriages and in the world? Mm -hmm. Peace, I experience peace. That's an extraordinary peace. Um, I, sh I experience somebody who's for me. Mm -hmm. I learn again that I'm not just a physical person, I'm a spiritual person. I believe that you can do for me in prayer what nobody upon the face of the earth and no angels and no saints can do for me. Mm -hmm. Now there's some things priests and popes and angels and saints can do for me. That, that I can't, can't do. do. But you have a place in my life right. of blessing me, praying for me, delivering me, fortifying me. And I have a special place in your life in you terms do. of authority and, mm -hmm. and praying for you and touching you mm -hmm. and praying over you. And we always touch one another in prayer mm -hmm. and we bless one another at the end of all of our, our prayers and we think about it like blowing upon the sail of a ship so I want to blow upon the sail of your life mm -hmm. God's life for you not not my life for you but God's life for you and so I just wanted to share some of those things the power the authority the peace the unity that comes from a man and a wife Loosing those graces, mm -hmm. those gifts that have been given just to me and just to you, for right. me, for you, right. together, that's not shared with anybody else. Mm -hmm. Do you understand, especially you men out there, the gift that you have to give to your wife, to your children? Pray with them. It's, it's so simple. You don't have to use a lot of words, but just mm -hmm. pray, lay hands upon them, and God will do amazing things. And I love how it dispels when we pray in the morning, the cobwebs of the night, you know, yeah. you get up and, and you're fresh, you're resetting, you're saying, yet again, to Jesus and to you, my beloved, I'm all in. Yeah. I'm all in, you know, no matter what this yeah. day brings. And there have been days we didn't know what the day was going to bring, yeah. but we were going to be all in. And we were going to be centered on the power of Jesus yeah. in our marriage and the power of the Holy Spirit to fortify us and to strengthen yeah. us to love better, to serve better. Um, because we always say, and we say this often, two things destroy marriage, mm -hmm. selfishness and prayerlessness. And so you want a healthy marriage, you want a happy marriage. Um, and I'm not saying it, marriages aren't, you know, there, there's problems in marriage. There's human beings in there. <laughs> there's gonna be energy, there's gonna be attitudes, there's gonna be junk because yeah. that's how we come with stuff. But we're working it out. And I like that Jesus is using you to get me to heaven. And mm -hmm. I know that Jesus is using me to get you Amen. to heaven. And that's, 
I mean, that is great. I mean, we're becoming holy by okay. God's grace and mercy. Marianne Budnick is up next. We're going to be speaking more about the sanctity of marriage and raising your children to be saints. Don't go away. We'll be right back. Welcome back. Well, you're an important part of the family, and we want to hear from you. Send us an email, jimandjoy at ewtn.com, and maybe we will answer your question right here on the air. And you can speak with us and Miss Marianne if you have a wonderful question for her, because she's so knowledgeable about so many things. Mm -hmm. She's authored so many books, and the books we're going to be talking about today are How to Raise Happy Children Through a Happy Marriage, and the other book title is Raise Happy Children, Raise Them Saints. Wow. If I read that book, I would think, okay, I did it. Now you should all come out to be saints, right? <laughs> we hope and pray. Right. Well, beautiful, Miss Marianne, tell us a little bit about yourself, where you were born and raised, and your marriage, and your children. And grandchildren. Um, I'm from the Chicago suburbs. I spent 24 years in Springfield, Illinois. That was probably the bulk of my adult life. Mm -hmm. And then from there, my husband and I moved down to South Florida. We've been there five and a half years. And then from there, we have moved to the rural Northwest. Mm -hmm. We have three raised daughters, um, and we have 11 grandchildren. And our middle daughter was just married this past Memorial Day weekend on her 45th birthday, which is exciting because mm -hmm. if anybody's out there praying novenas for Mr. Wonderful, <laughs> keep them going. He showed up. He showed up, mm -hmm. yes. <laughs> and it's never too late, is it? It's never too late, no, no. So, well, what, what motivated you to write the books that you authored about raising children to be saints? Is that possible? Can we do that? and about having, raising happy children through having, through having a happy marriage. How does that work? I actually wrote the books when my daughter started to get married because I wanted to pass along to them all of the material that I had learned mm -hmm. and some of the material I felt that I had learned late in life. And if they could have it when their children were just born and could truly raise them up as saints, how exciting. Because that's exactly what we're called to do, that uh, we are to populate heaven with saints. And so many people have said, um, I wrote my very first book was, um, You Can Become a Saint. And I've had so many comments with people saying, oh, I can't become a saint. But they keep forgetting that um, the only people that get to heaven are saints. Right. So if we want to get to heaven, we are going to have to strive for holiness. And after I wrote that book, people who had read it asked me to write a book on how to raise their children saints, kind of step by step. In the history of the church, um, as I was starting to do the research, I saw that we have so many families of saints. We really don't learn much about that, but Saint Felicity, she was a saint, and her seven sons were all canonized. Wow. Then we have Saint Bernard and his family. He was canonized, but his six brothers were beatified. We have Saint Monica, and her problem child was Saint Augustine, mm -hmm. and he not only was canonized, but he's a doctor of the church, but she had two other children who um, were beatified. And um, if you go through the beginning of the church up until the 17th century, we have quite a few family saints where the father is a saint, the daughter, the granddaughter, the uncles, the aunts. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's really beautiful mm -hmm. to see. But then after the 17th century, it kind of dies off. And the next family is the Martin wow. family with right. St. Therese. Mm -hmm. So we, re we really have to work on this now to raise our children to become saints. Well, speak to us, you're speaking about in those that you listed, canonized saints. Yes. So most of us will not be canonized, but nonetheless, we are to be saints, walking in the way of holiness and, and all the way until the end to persevere. 
Um, so you've written, you teach on individuals trying to live saintly lives, yes. aiming for saint, and, and marriage, married couples and children and the relationship with all of these. Um, we're kind of confused these days, at least in secular society, maybe some people even in the church, in speaking about marriage. Yes. You know, what is marriage? What is a valid marriage? What is a sacramental marriage? Um, what is marriage and what, is it, what does it do? How could we know that we're in a valid marriage or a, a sacramental marriage? There is a lot of confusion about that today. To have a, va a valid marriage, there are five important points and each one has to be fulfilled. Okay. For, first of all, there can be no impediment into going into that marriage, such as a valid prior marriage. There are also many other impediments, but that is a major one. The second one is that we have to be um, free to give our free will to this marriage. We aren't being coerced into the marriage, right. such as an unplanned pregnancy that forces us to say, oh, I better get married. Or maybe parental pressure. You're getting kind of old now. I think, you know, she's a nice girl. Or he's mm -hmm. a nice guy, marry him. We, um, I know of one case where the groom wanted to call off the marriage and the bride-to-be threatened suicide. So he was coerced mm -hmm. into going through with that marriage. So we have to have the free will. The third thing is that we have to be open to the children that God will send to us. We can't think that we're going to be married in the Catholic Church and then plan that we're not going to have any children, so we're going to contracept or we're going to be sterilized. That would invalidate a marriage. Um, the fourth is that marriage is forever. It's not until the going gets tough we get out of it. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, so many people today, and we see this even on fluffy movies where a girl is trying to decide at the last minute, oh, do I really love him? Should I? Well, I'll go through with it, and if it doesn't work out, I'll just divorce him. No, you know, marriage is a covenant. We cannot break a covenant. And it is forever, for better or for worse. We, we've never heard of anybody divorcing somebody because they were richer or they were better, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> or they were the healthiest person right. on the planet, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> and then the fifth one is the marriage has to be consummated. And um, St. John Paul II the Great, he told the Roman Rhoda in Rome that if all of those conditions are met, even he as a pope could not annul a valid marriage. A pope can only annul a marriage that was not valid because one of those five points was missing. So you're saying those five components are for any man and woman yes, who, man. who make that covenant. Yes. It doesn't necessarily mean that they are Christian or religious or whatever. That's a marriage if those components are there and they're consenting to that, they understand that they're freely giving themselves to it, they understand about children, they understand you know, faithfulness. Um, that's a marriage, that's a valid marriage. That is a and valid it marriage. it can't be annulled. So, because sometimes I hear people, I think, that they're saying, well, if it's not a sacramental marriage, then, it, uh, you know, it should be annulled. It could easily be annulled because uh, it's not a sacramental marriage. They probably want to be in a sacramental marriage, and that wasn't, therefore, this should be annulled. That's not the case. Yeah. Yeah. So, what's the difference with a sacramental marriage and a, a valid marriage? Okay, a sacramental marriage is a valid marriage, okay. but it's between two baptized Christians. Okay. Um, a marriage between a Catholic or a Christian to a non-baptized person right. is a valid marriage, but it's not a sacramental marriage. A sacramental marriage is, is a tremendous infusion of graces mm. to the married couple to help them through all the hard spots. As Father Hardin used to say, um, it, it helps you to know exactly what the will of God wants the husband to do and what the will of God wants the wife to do and how the two of them are supposed to work together wow. to raise their children saints. Mm -hmm. So the, it's, it's a tremendous infusion of constant graces that we get as long as we are in the state of sanctifying grace. Mm -hmm. um, we can be in a sacramental marriage, 
But then after we are married, we decide that we've had enough children and so we're going to contracept or, or we're going to be sterilized. Then you have lost your sanctifying grace. You've cut yourself off from God and you've cut yourself off from those sacramental graces mm -hmm. that, that we really need. Marriage is the hardest vocation because you're taking two completely different people and you're putting them together and um, original sin and its effects come in and we tend to be selfish and we want to do things our way and we would like our spouse to serve us rather than us serving our spouse. And so that's why we need those graces because marriage is complete self-giving. Mm -hmm. You're giving everything you have to your spouse wow. and then your spouse is supposed to do the same for you. Mm -hmm. but you know, in a lot of marriages we don't have that. So um, married couples need to intensify their spiritual life so they keep not only their sacramental um, graces flowing and the sanctifying grace, but also deepen their interior life through mass and the sacraments, um, mental prayer, saying the daily rosary, particularly the family rosary, which is so important. And because to raise children in that, if the husband and wife aren't on the same page, right, and they're both saying, I'm all in and I choose by an act of my will to die totally to myself today and to live for you. So, and if, because people get married today and it's like, well, but if he does that, then I'll do this. Yes. Right? And yes. that's not the way it goes. No. You know, it's like, mm. and then it's like, well, but he's not serving me and he's not, you know, well, somebody has to change. And, That's right. and maybe people didn't come from that model. They've never had that modeled to them. And so they come to their marriage with their bad marriage from their families, right? Mm -hmm. And But mm -hmm. God wants to make something new. Mm -hmm. So you have to leave the old furniture and say, no, we got new stuff here and God's going to make us one. And mm -hmm. I think it takes a lifetime. It does take a lifetime. Yeah. Yes. Yes, we've been married 48 years, and I can see that the joy in our marriage now is so much greater mm -hmm. than it was the day that we walked down the aisle. And at that point, I thought I was going to burst with joy. Mm -hmm. I was so ha happy. But now cannot even compare to that for the joy and the happiness that we have together. But you know, I, I don't want to leave the people who are in a valid marriage, right. but not a sacramental, um, feeling that, well, what happens to me? Right. Because Christ will bless that marriage through the Christian partner and the graces that that Christian partner receives. And God will bless the family too and actually raise it up, not to a sacramental marriage, but above a strictly natural marriage. And it's very interesting. Um, Bishop Peter Elliott from Australia wrote a beautiful book on the sacrament of marriage and he said that um, by the spouse, the non-Christian spouse loving and cherishing the Christian spouse, that he unknowingly is loving Christ. Mm. Isn't that beautiful? That is beautiful. So in a way he's becoming what he's put in quotes, consecrated. Mm -hmm. This sac marriage is a sacrament, graces. Do you find that even those who are supposed to be in sacramental marriages, they were both Christians, have been united, or both Catholics and together, do you find that there's a lot of awareness of that in the couples about what it means to have a sacramental marriage, about I talk about loosing the graces or even building up the graces within us. What do you find in terms of working with couples, their understanding of these mystery, the mystery they've been given, number one, and then working that out, you know, developing that? What do you find? I, I don't think the majority of Christians understand this at all. I think um, probably most of your audience will be hearing this for the very first wow. time, yeah. which is very sad. 
the sacramental graces not only affect the couple, but it spills over into the family too. And one of the things that I find so char so charming about this, it's it's a fun sacrament to be able to get mm -hmm. graces mm -hmm. because any sign of affection that you do for your spouse, you get sacramental graces mm -hmm. for. So mm -hmm. I mean, it's a, so it, a hug, a kiss, filling up the cup of coffee, um, just a compliment, mm -hmm. and marital relations is a time that you will get tremendous sacramental and sanctifying grace mm -hmm. if it's not compromised by using contraceptives or yeah. sterilization. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that, you know, it is true, because it's kind of scary. It's like they got everything they need to work, make this thing work, love yeah. for a lifetime. But now you got to go work everything you got. That's right. Supernaturally, now you gotta, you gotta die to yourself, mm -hmm. but God's given you everything that we, when we said, I do, he gave us everything, all the graces, like now, now go and do it, right? And, and you know, they're coming down the aisle and they're so full of love and they're so full of life. And everybody in the, in the church is cheering for them because you want them mm -hmm. so to succeed. You want them to go the distance, you know, but so many times people are not prepared um, in you know premarital counseling, they don't understand um, what they're getting into, and then it's kind of like you know they're six months in and they're like, oh, this isn't for me, mm -hmm. you know, and 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 the divorce rate is is as equally as it is in the church as it is in the world. It is. It's forty-eight to fifty percent, mm -hmm. which is a terrible statistic. For those who you know, you mentioned contraception. Um, uh, there's other sins as well that could stop these graces. How do we get restored? How do we begin again? Because we don't want people to think as well, well, I've committed the unpardonable sin. Uh, my grace is cut off forever here. What's the avenue of healing? Great question. Confession. God has, is so good to us that he has provided the wonderful sacrament of reconciliation. So no matter what we do, we can have it forgiven in confession, but we have to be sorry for it. Um, um, I, met a, I was in a situation where somebody had been using contraception for a long time and had some very serious consequences because mm -hmm. of it. Mm -hmm. And this, this, this really had an impact on the marriage and even on her physical health. Mm -hmm. And I was trying to explain to her all you have to do is go to confession and confess it with sincerity mm -hmm. and be sorry for it. Yeah. And she said, well, I've been to confession before and I've confessed it, but I'm really not sorry <laughs> for it because I don't think what I did was wrong. Mm -hmm. So she's putting herself back. Mm -hmm. we, we have to humble ourselves and say, I don't have all the answers. Right. If, if this is what God says I should do or I shouldn't do, follow it because only then will you be happy. God only wants us happy. Right, and to say in confession, m maybe at the time in my own stupid wisdom, I thought this was a good thing, mm -hmm. but God, now that I see the light and I know the truth about everything that you wanted to give to me, I failed you and I broke your heart. Let's hold it you know? right there, Joy. We're speaking with Marianne Budnick and we're speaking about strengthening marriage and the family and raising happy children to be saints. We'll be right back. More to come, don't go away. Welcome back. Well, you're at home with Jim and Joy. And remember, you know, we want you to be a part of our show. If you have a question for today's guest, give us a jingle during our live broadcast. You're in North America, give us a call at 1 800 221 9460. Outside of North America, you can reach us at area code 205 271 2980. 
can always send us an email, jimandjoy at EWTN.com, and maybe we will use your question on the air. Well, right now, you know, EWTN Religious Catalog has a new compilation of Mother Angelica's straightforward solutions to life's puzzling problems, put together in a great book form with the help of Christine Allison, and it's called Mother Angelica's Answers, Not Promises. And you can order this great book by going to EWTNRC.com or give them a call at 1-800-854-6316 and it's item number 80046. I promise you it will be a great summer read. Well, right now we have Lisa on the phone. And Lisa, welcome to At Home with Jim and Joy. Your question or your comment for Marianne. Um, is it okay to practice natural family planning without having like a grave sin or an illness? Can any couple practice? Or does there have to be a reason why you're practicing natural family planning? Okay, thank you for your question. That's a very good question. You can practice natural family pr planning because it's not artificial contraception. Um, and a priest once told me that if God wants you to have a child, even when you're practicing natural family planning, then he will, he will squeeze it in. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, it's, like put, it's like putting a little coin in your pocket. So you are open to life, even though you are using natural. Right. right. Okay. I want to get back to the graces in the sacrament of marriage, not only for the man and wife together, but with the children. And like we were sharing at the beginning of the show, uh, authority and prayer and power with joy, with me, me with joy, does that go as well for us with the children, our uniqueness, our authority, can we lose more graces upon them or grace upon them? Oh, absolutely. But again, that was a very new concept for, for me. Um, our youngest daughter, when she had her fourth baby, he was always crying. And we have a friend, Bishop Gerard Scarponi, OFM, who is the emeritus bishop from Comayaga, Honduras. He's a, he's a missionary bishop. And I had told him about her problem because they were kind of at loss what to mm. do. And so um, he said, you have tremendous graces to pray for your child over any problem that you have. So what he did was he sent me a prayer and the father and the mother is supposed to put their hands on the child's head yeah. and pray this prayer. And I think we have a slide for that. Okay. Um, it's a very short, it's just a couple of sentences. And my, our daughter and son-in-law did that with their son and the crying stopped immediately. Mm -hmm. And Bishop Scarponi said that he had found that prayer to be so powerful that he has seen parents pray it in his presence and have a child that was seriously ill cured. Mm. But it's not just to pray over the child, it, it would be to pray over your spouse too. Okay. This past weekend, as we were getting ready to, to leave on our, our trip, my body kind of fell apart and I just couldn't get everything put together to leave in time the next day. And so as I was getting up my papers, I saw that prayer and so I said, Bob, would you mind praying it over me? And he said the two sentence prayer, mm -hmm. and I was like, I was back to normal. Mm -hmm. yeah. It was yeah. just miraculous. I remember seeing that. We don't have it right before us, but I, what is the gist of it? Is it as, as a parent, I lay my Asking hands upon God. you. Dear God, please, here's the need for my son, for my daughter, and we're, we're asking your remedy. Right. In the name we, of Jesus. We don't know the cause of this problem right now, but you do, Father, and please cure it. Right. You know, and we, we did have the luxury of praying over our children every single day as they grew up in our house. And, um, and it was, it, it, I would love it even when they would be sick or something or now and now we're even with our grandchildren and it's so beautiful. But, you know, they would say, Mama, pray. Mama, pray. Because it becomes so natural. 
You know, that it's not like, okay, now we have to stop and pray and we have to get in this holy zone and all this. It's like, no, like we, I was in the car with my grandchild the other day and an ambulance went by and Cece mm -hmm. looked at me and said, Nona, let's pray a rosary right now. Oh. And, and we were like, okay. And you know, we did, we went through the thing and I just, I said, Cece, that was so great. Yeah. You know, because we, ha we have, they're not going to catch it unless you teach it and unless you live it. And it's not, and not that it's complicated. It has to be easy and beautiful and free so that they would be like, I mean, our kids have gone into situations, they'd be like, well, pray. And people would look like, pray? Why would we pray? It's like, because that's what we do. We pray. Like, we need help. You know, we can't, we can't solve this, right? That's and right. That's, and that's what we want. We want it to be so natural and easy and so beautiful. Our grandchildren lay hands on their mother who's oh. pregnant with their seventh child and they pray. Oh. Right? And that's, I mean, that's the beauty. But children aren't going to know it unless it's modeled to them. And that's they right. see it constantly all the time. That's right. Yes. What are the steps, what are the components for raising children to be saints? Well, first of all, you have to start with the marriage relationship. And the richness of that and the depth of that and parents striving to become saints themselves right. will raise, as we said before, holy children. Now, there are many people who are single parents, but they can still raise their children saints. It, it's just as with every other aspect in a single family, it just takes more effort mm -hmm. and a lot more work. Mm -hmm. But God will reward their efforts. The second step is to teach our children to love God. Um, Saint Therese, she always talked about God as the good God. And how beautiful that, that yeah. is, because when we start to talk to our, our little ones and we put the adjective God, good in front of God, that just opens a whole world for them. And then we can show them the good God has given us a sunny day, mm -hmm. or we have rain for our plants, or the good God made this delicious food, or your nice bed. So constantly going back to the good God, and then that in turn should be wedded with the virtue of gratitude to thank God for everything he has given us. Daddy's job, mommy and daddy together here, our home. I think the best example of gratitude that I've ever met is actually Mother Angelica. Mm -hmm. um, we were blessed to spend four days with her and through that she was thanking God all the time and it wasn't always with good things. She was thanking him for the contradictions. Mm -hmm. She was thanking him for when things worked out and when things didn't work out. Yeah. And it was always, thank you, Jesus. Yes. Thank you, Jesus. Yeah. What an impression it made on us. Mm -hmm. yeah. So besides that, um, and then teaching the prayers, when a little one is small, um, to point out everything and start to tell them the words, even though they can't register. it. It is, they are learning mm -hmm. on a certain level. And then to blow a kiss to Our Lady and to Our Lord. And then when it can start to talk, I love you, Jesus. I love you, Mary. Mm -hmm. Help us. Um, one of the things that I found very interesting was when I was doing the research on the book, it talked, there. I found studies in which the spirituality of the mother had a tremendous influence on her unborn child. Mm -hmm. And so when you are pregnant with a child, mm -hmm. that is the time to deepen your interior life, not to kind of slack off because you're tired or not feeling well, but to really deepen your prayer life, try to get to mass more often, get to frequent confession. These are all very uh, powerful steps. And then as the children, are growing older, then we need to teach them more of the prayers, the Hail Mary, the Our Father, the Creed, the Act of Contrition. By the age of three, a child can say a decade of a rosary mm -hmm. by himself. Mm -hmm. it's, mm -hmm. it's very, very impressive. Right. Um, and then we can teach a child about the guardian angels when they're in a fearful situation, when they're afraid of a storm mm -hmm. or afraid of the dark or some other thing. Mm -hmm. We can tell about the angel who's there to protect them. And then um, 
Also, we can start to teach them the divine mercy aspiration. Jesus, I trust in you, too, in a time of fear. One time I was um, stuck on an elevator with our middle daughter, mm -hmm. and she was about five at the time, and we were in a great big department store, and it was a great big elevator, and there was a lot of people there. Yeah. And it, it just jammed, and it wouldn't go up or down. And so um, I was watching her, and I could see that yeah. she was really getting mm -hmm. nervous. And so, so I, I, was, I was praying for her, and I was praying for the situation. And then, then when it was all over, I said, well, when we got out, because she had been separated yeah. from me, and I said, well, did you pray to your guardian angel? And she said, I did, but he, I saw him in the corner of my mind, and he was just as scared as me. <laughs> <laughs> that is so true. You know, we were on vacation with the grandkids recently, and um, we were talking to the grands about guardian angels, and, and they, they have a name, you know? And, me, did you ever ask your angel what his name was? You know, and they're three and they're four, and they're just beyond. You know, they're just so open. You know, so uh, <laughs> Sophia, one of our little grands, she said, "Oh, she closes her eyes and she goes, I think his name is Fellow, so I'm going to call him Fellow." So she she went the whole vacation. She was like, "Is my Fellow with me?" And I said, "I'm sure your Fellow is with you." Yeah, I mean, but that's the beauty of it. Or when you're with your children or your grandchildren and they're stuck in tablets and screens, mm -hmm. you know, we were the kids were in the back seat, and I said, "Put the tablets down and let's look at God's tablet." the sky. Yeah. Let's look at the beauty. And so then Sophia said, you know, she was the younger one, always wanted to tell the older sister what to do. She goes, you heard Nona. Let's look at God's tablet and let's see what he made for us. And then it's another way to raise up saints, right? Right, God's right. created order, making the time just to simply look and say there's nothing that compares with that. That really impacted our grandkids. Yeah. Yes. And well, that's because they're so impressionable right now and they just think we're rather wonderful. Yeah, but it's competition. Right. I mean, is it the creation or is it this thing that I'm looking right. at? Right. Or is it the Who's, movie that's that we're not going to give me life, you no. know? But it's you not going to make you happy or no. joyful. Mm -mm. Well, we're going to go straight to an email. It says, after 14 years of marriage, my husband has expressed interest in becoming Catholic. I was raised in a Catholic family but haven't practiced since I was in grade school. I was never confirmed. We're both pursuing RCIA classes and we are wondering what we can do to have a sacramental marriage. Can we ask a priest to bless our marriage as it is now or do we wait until we both have been formally received into the church? And this is from Susan in San Francisco. Okay, well Susan is a fallen away Catholic um, her husband, I he wasn't he wasn't raised Catholic, but he's expressed interest, and okay. so they're both in the RCIA class. We don't know if he's a baptized Christian or not. Or, so or not. not sure. Okay, yeah. I would think I would go and talk to your to to the priest mm -hmm. and um, expl express that you want to have a sacrament sacramental marriage, and ask what steps he, he would suggest that you take. <clears throat> I would assume he would wait until they came through the, right. completed the RCIA program. Right. Yeah. Would you I think, think they're in the right place. Yes. Like to be in RCIA, you can yes. sense that the Spirit's stirring things within them. You know, a really good book, Susan, to get is The Faith Explained. Okay. I think that you and your husband would learn so much about the Catholic faith mm -hmm. from that book. Any other thoughts, components with raising children to be saints? You mentioned so many, Joy mentioned the created order. Um, what are the avenues to open them up to, for them to experience? We have to teach them virtues. This is really, really key because we have people that um, know their faith. They may go to daily mass every day. They may say the rosary every day but they're nasty people. Mm. And it's because they have not developed the natural virtues such as kindness and charity and thoughtfulness and generosity. There's about 100 different virtues. But there are 12 fundamental virtues that need to be taught to children from the ages of one to 12. And then an additional 20 virtues that need to be taught between the ages of 13 and 18. The second group of virtues build on the first group. Okay. So if you don't have the foundation of the 12, it's going to be very hard to teach chastity. The key virtue to start with is obedience. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. And so many times when you have that cute little child, you just don't want to teach obedience. They're just so cute and everything that they're doing, even though it's not great, um, kind of tugs at your heartstrings. But it's very important that they learn this virtue of obedience and learn it young, because if they do not obey you, they're mm -hmm. not going to obey God. Right. So this is a very key point. And then it's very important to realize that parents are the primary educators of their children, that even if you send your child to a Catholic school, um, the school only supplements what you supposedly have already taught your child. At the domestic church. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. So this is very, very key. Um, when our children were growing up, um, our purpose was to raise them as good, faithful, moral Catholics. And then I went to an evening of recollection, and the priest there told us that if we were not consciously striving to raise our children saints, that our children would be lost. The faith would be lost to them today in our culture. Let's just hold that right there. We'll be right back with more on strengthening marriage and the family and raising your children to be saints. Don't go away. There's more to come. We will be right back. Well, you know, you're an important part of our family here at EWTN, and we would love for you to join us live at home. All you have to do is contact the EWTN Pilgrimage Department, and you do that by emailing them at pilgrimages at EWTN.com or give them a jingle at 205 271 2966. You might have this on um, one of your life to do lists is to come and visit EWTN, this great, wonderful place that Mother Angelica has built. And so we'd love to have you come to Irondale, Alabama. Uh, we had a question on natural family planning. I'm a little confused about exactly what was asked and so on, but is there anything more we need to say about natural family planning in the question, possibly? L Lisa had asked about um, can you use natural family planning? And yes, you can, but you do need to have a serious grave reason to use it. Mm -hmm. A serious grave reason to use it to prevent pregnancy? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Not to prevent, but to say, at this time, time we for cannot. serious reasons and matter, we're, we think it's best not to have a child at this point. Right. But of course, in the relationship, a child can come to pass because right. you're not. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, so what are those reasons? Mm -hmm. um, that's good to think through serious physical health reasons, or it could be emotional reasons at that point. So there are a variety of reasons. You can always consult a priest or a deacon about that mm -hmm. uh, to to answer those those questions yeah all right well straight we're going to go straight to Rome to hear from Joan to see what she has for us today Joan well greetings from Rome to all of you at home on another very hot July day in the city but it's hot everywhere I guess you know I, I want to talk about your uh, focus today on the importance of marriage the family and the faith formation of children because this what you've been talking about echoes generations of Catholic Church teaching and of papal documents on this topic, on faith formation. In fact, Pope Francis's 2016 Apostolic Exhortation on Moris Laetitiae, he said specifically, parents always influence the moral development of their children, for better or for worse. He said it follows they should take up this essential role and carry it out consciously, enthusiastically, reasonably, and appropriately. And the Pope noted how raising children calls for an orderly process of handing on the faith. He said this is made difficult by current lifestyles, the way people work, the complexity of society today. And he said many people just keep up a frenetic pace just, just to survive. But the Pope said even, even so, the home has continued to be the place we learn to appreciate the meaning and beauty of the faith, to pray and serve our neighbor. And you know, Pope Francis stressed what we already know, and that is, 
education in the faith has to adapt to each child, since older resources and recipes, he said, don't always work. So young children, they need symbols and actions and stories. But adolescents, because they have a little bit of a problem sometimes with authority and with rules, it's best to encourage them uh, in their own experience of faith and to give them very credible witnesses, which are always a thing of beauty. Now, in addition, Jim and Joy, we know that the Catechism of the Catholic Church is very clear on this, as was John Paul in Familiaris Consortio in 1981. He said, since parents have conferred life on their children, they have a most solemn obligation to educate their offspring. Hence, parents must be acknowledged as the first and foremost educators of their children. And get this, he says, their role as educators is so decisive that scarcely anything can, can uh, compensate for their failure in it. Really important words, but can I share something with you? Just a few more seconds of time. It's hot, and I'm walking around with this great fan. You can see Pope Francis, and on the back it says, we're fans of Pope Francis. And this is from the St. Paul Seminary in Minnesota. So your laugh for the day. Back to you at home. Thank you so much, Joan. Another wonderful report there from Rome. And Joan was really hitting on quite a bit of what we were sharing about the domestic church, the importance of the family gathering together. Spoke about rules and some discipline for children. You spoke about obedience being such an important virtue to really build upon with our children. We've got about five minutes or so, five and a half minutes left. Uh, what would you like to share? You might want to continue on the virtues or any other aspect of marriage and, and working I, with children. I think maybe on the education of your children in the faith because this is so critical. So many people have sent their children to the Catholic Church thinking that they were going to learn all their prayers and, and all the teachings there and they've graduated with their, a loss of faith instead of a deepening of, of the mm -hmm. faith. So it's very important that parents realize that they need to be the ones to teach their children the prayers. I found a very effective way um, of teaching rote in the car because everybody seat belted in, there's very few distractions and you, ha you have a captive audience yeah. and it's very easy for them to learn the prayers that, that way, to go through the Ten Commandments, to teach them what they actually mean. That this is not something that God gives us to spoil our fun, but mm -hmm. He wants to save us from any unhappiness because sin attracts sorrow and problems, mm -hmm. whereas holiness attracts joy. Even in the midst of suffering, you have an interior joy and happiness. Um, what we did in our family is, even though our daughters were going to a Catholic school or a, pr a private school run by Catholic lay people, my husband at night um, would teach them catechism himself. So we got a very good, I think it was life and living, it was from Ignatius Press. Mm -hmm. And uh, he would do a chapter a night with the girls so that they would really, really know their faith. And um, thank God they are still all practicing Catholics. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, as I hear you share and I'm just thinking about our viewers out here and those listening and you know, what you speak about takes time. It you, does. You've got to a lifetime. make mm -hmm. time. And you got to make time to think about the time that you're going to take with your children, with your marriage. And you know, cause some people might be saying, well, how are you going to do all this? Well, just think about what you do during the day and how much time you give to this, to that, to TV, to radio, if it's not EWTN. And uh, you really do have a lot of time, but it's your commitment to building a relationship with your wife, with your husband, with your children, with your grandchildren, teaching them intentionally, formally, and informally as you drive in the car, as you walk by the way, as you put them down to bed, as it says in Deuteronomy, just in simple ways, as you walk along the way, just teach them the things of the commandments of God, the way of Almighty God. But we've gotta make the commitment to that as parents. That's right, and sometimes we have our children so programmed that they're going from the time they get up in the morning until they're going to bed right. at night with the dancing and, mm -hmm. and the sports and everything else, and we leave out the most important, mm -hmm. the, their soul. Right. 
And this we, we really have to protect. Yeah, I like our, our son-in-law and our daughter. They have, um, she's pregnant with her seventh, and, and they realize that. You know, they have them in Catholic school. They're doing a great job in raising the children and, and teaching the faith and a great marriage. But, you know, they were doing one more sport event, one more sport event. And, and they intercepted the schedule and said, no, on this night, it's going to be your soul event, and you're going to. And then it was, and then they got involved in the father and son, um, you know, group where they both could journey together, because we do, and we have access. I mean, chances are our children are not going to be professional athletes, you know, but we want them <laughs> to be saints. We want them to be holy. So all the time and the energy that we have to invest in them, and sometimes it's it's out of whack. You know, and and they're not happy people. Yeah. You know, and they they don't know the purpose for which they were created, and they don't know their destiny. They don't know where they're going. That's right. You know, and then we failed them. That's right. So we have to take an inventory of saying, how are we doing this? What are we doing as parents? And how are we in our marriage? You have to stop. Like it, it takes time to have a conversation, just to have. Um, how are we? Are we happy? Are we in a rut? Are we stuck? What have we done for ourselves spiritually? You know, we're doing all this stuff around the house and all this stuff, but where are we? A closing right? thought, closing word for our viewers today. If you want to be happy, be holy. And if you want your children to be saints, then you as a parent has to be holy and striving for holiness. Marianne, thank you so much for being with us today. You're just a wealth of knowledge and God's beauty just radiates through you because you're walking in that way of holiness. Thank you for being with us today. God bless you. God bless all of your loved ones. And remember that life, marriage, and the family will prevail. Keep it on EWTN. Bye now.